meant that there's been a slightly change in the policy airport, and so he, he will speak in the afternoon, and so we'll have a switch, and Professor uh, Roduzakis will be, uh, and Professor Kurz will speak in the afternoon. So we are going to have this four speaker. I'm going to be stricter than Professor Repapis as a chairperson. People who know me so that I can be very strict about this. So we're aiming to have about 15 minutes each. So the goal is to end by 1.30 rather than 1. Try to stick. Uh, pleasure to introduce Professor Aregam. In the mid-1970s, after the first oil price shocks, two elements came together, a rising rate of unemployment in the Western world and new technological developments, at that time the so-called microelectronics revolution. And therefore, a new interest started again. Sometimes there are long waves in economics and economic theory too, on issues of technological unemployment. And this had the implication that there was a growing interest in Chapter 31 on machinery of Ricardo's principles, which, according to Sraffa, was the most revolutionary change in the third and last edition of Ricardo's principles, and also on an article which Knut Wixell wrote in the late 1920s, and he submitted it to the Economic Journal, and it was rejected by the editor Keynes as being of no interest at all anymore. And more than half a century later, it was published in the very same economic journal where Keynes had the paper rejected when he was the editor. And Bixell, who was a radical social reformer, but also a hardcore neoclassical or marginalist theorist, was heavily criticizing uh, Ricardo's chapter on machinery for neglecting the impact of the displacement effect on real wages, a downward pressure on real wages, and the consequential compensation process, as well as about the effect of new machinery on output. And this issue has caused many leading economists, it was also already the case in the 19th century when authors like Marx wrote on the issue of technological unemployment and on Ricardo's machinery chapter, but John Hicks, Luigi Pasinetti, Adolf Lowe, Paul Samuelson were among the authors, modern authors who made modern uh, important contributions, who set out to vindicate, and Paul Samuelson in particular had a certain influence with two articles published in 1988 and 89 in the Journal of Political Economy and the Scandinavian Journal of Economics, where he set out to vindicate Ricardo's proposition, in particular the analytical question as to whether a viable invention can reduce the total real output in the economy. After all, competitive prices adjust to clear oil markets. And Samuelson came to the conclusion, Ricardo was right, but Wixell, Caldo, and many others were wrong. And uh, he made his clear, very cl case very clear by thus ruling for Ricardo the judge is ruling against the plaintiff in the famous suit Vixel versus Ricardo, in which Vixel denied that a viable invention could reduce aggregate output. My title, the t one title was Ricardo was right, <laughs> therefore could have been the less gracious one, Vixel was wrong. <laughs> now, uh, Samuelson was surely right with regard to Caldo. Caldo was wrong. But that was the kind of 1932, when from a Keynesian perspective, he was a Saulus and not yet mutated to a Paulus later in the 1930s. And Caldor wrote an article in Economica, the London School of Economics uh, Journal, 
where he was writing a long review article on a book which had been published in German by Emil Lederer, who was professor first in Heidelberg, then in Berlin, and after emigration from Nazi Germany in 33, became the founding dean of the, uh, the university in exile at the New School for Social Research in New York. And the book was on technical progress and unemployment. And due to that book, later I was invited to write a much more expanded book by uh, the International Labor Office in Geneva, which then was published in English in 1938. Later I was also right on many issues, <laughs> in contrast to Caldor, but I have no time to uh, talk on him. Uh, the story is a bit more complicated with regard to John Hicks. And Samuelson himself, Sir, Sir John, has escaped his attention uh, because uh, Hicks himself had written an article where he confronted Sir John with J.R. <laughs> if you look at the writings of Hicks, uh, the young Hicks, who was strongly neoclassical and wrote Value and Capital, for which he for greater part got the Nobel Prize in economics, uh, was thoroughly neoclassical. Uh, and he signed always as J.R. Hicks, John Richard Hicks. And the watershed year was 1956, and his contribution, Methods of Dynamic Analysis, to the Lindahl Festschrift. After that, he signed only as John Hicks, <laughs> later Sir John. And Jeff Harcourt, as well as Luigi Pasinetti, have reflected and written on Sir John versus uh, J.R. Now, but Hicks, in 1932, when he was mainly a neoclassical economist and a labor economist and at the London School of Economics, wrote the theory of wages, where the most important chapter for the modern developments is chapter six on distribution and economic progress, in which Hicks gave birth to the concept of the elasticity of substitution, a core neoclassical uh, technical variable, and also to Hicks neutral labor saving and capital saving technical progress. But there's a very interesting shorter passage which has the title, Inventions Must Increase the Social Div Dividend. And this is important for the Ricardo Vixel issue. And I have here a longer quotation uh, from this passage uh, in, on page 121 in Hicks' Theory of Wages. Uh, and he is talking, and they have marked it in bold letters, on the ultimate effect which is to increase the national dividend. You have to make a clear distinction between the short-run implications of the new technology which is introduced and the long-run ones. And in the long run, Hicks says the total dividend must be increased as soon as the liberate resources can be effectively transferred to the new uses. So this is a kind of condition. If you have technological unemployment at the beginning, it may happen what Ricardo was emphasizing, that the social, uh, social dividend, or we would say GNP or GDP, would decline. Uh, but uh, the unused resources, unemployment, or also uh, underutilized capacities have to be used effectively, and then the total dividend must increase. Uh, one also who was not dealt with by Paul Samuelson in his two articles of 1988 and 89 was Hans Neisser, who was very favorably mentioned by Keynes in his treatise on money because Neisser two years before had written a book on the exchange value of money. And, but he was a great theorist who also emigrated from Nazi Germany in 1933. He before was at the Kiel Institute of World Economics. But Neisser, and this is the interesting piece here, had written an article on the wage rate and employment in market equilibrium. But this article was published in German and only in structural change and economic dynamics. There were editors and past editors participating here, <laughs> Ivano Cardinale, for example, or Roberto Scazzieri. Uh, the English translation came out in 1990. So Samuelson seemingly did not know the article in 1988-89. And uh, it's important for two issues. One is that it is an important contribution to the development of modern general equilibrium theory, which then had an impact also on Abraham Wald and von Neumann, who were mentioned. 
that it's not enough to have as many equations as you have uh, variables in the system for positive solutions. Now, the interesting part in this context here is NICE's critical examination of Wixell's critique on Ricardo. So the hypothesis of the present essay is that the employment of workers can only be increased if the amount of physical capital is increased at the same time. So no doubt uh, uh, that this is a correct argument and very much in line uh, with Samuelson's contributions. Um, and one has to say, and Nice is very clear about it, that it was already Ricardo who provided the key to the modern view of the problem, namely the capital accumulation argument, uh, to the fact that machinery is used more often in countries with high wages than in low wage countries. And NYSE explicitly refers to Ricardo's statement that machinery and labor are in con constant competition and the former can frequently not be employed until labor rises. Unfortunately, NYSE stops just before Ricardo's anticipation of Marx's idea of the tendency towards a growing organic composition of capital when Ricardo writes, the demand for labor will continue to increase with an increase of capital, but not in proportion to its increase. The ratio will necessarily be a dimin diminishing ratio. This is what Marx uh, was further elaborating on. But coming back uh, to NYSA, the central question which he addresses is to what extent additional workers can be employed on a given capital stock when wages are flexible downwards. The normal neoclassical argument also in the elasticity of substitution would be if there's unemployment maybe caused by new technologies being introduced, then unemployment rises, so there's a downward pressure on labor, uh, on wages, which makes labor relatively cheaper so that there would be an increase in the demand for labor. This would be the normal argument. And NYSA clearly develops an answer to this question, is arguing that it depends on the technologically determined shapes of the revenue curves. And he's very precise on that. I have no time to discuss it here, uh, particularly when there is a variation of capital intensity due to the introduction of a new machine which is associated with a change in net and gross output. And he clearly shows, decades before Samuelson, that Ricardo was right when he made the argument there could be uh, changes in technique which had this implication that in the short run uh, there might be a decline in the national dividend. And NYSA then elaborated Ricardo's argument that the demand for labor will continue to increase with an increase of capital only. It never has been doubted by any theorist of rank that the accumulation of capital in the form of fixed equipment raises the demand for labor. So he definitely could not be accused what Paul in a later article in 94, half a decade later, has called the classical, classical fallacy that fixed capitals are prejudicial to wages and the demand for labor where circulating capitals are favorable. Nice already had a critique of the wage fund doctrine uh, too. Now, Hicks between 1965 and 1973 was very much attracted by Ricardo's machinery chapter. It started with this smaller book on the theory of economic history in 1969, and he worked on that and he made a kind of transformation. And it's very clear uh, that Hicks made a distinction between the short run uh, consequences where you may have a decline and then the long run impact that uh, there are certain incentives uh, for capital accumulation which would raise employment again. And uh, NYSA, who emigrated in 33, had a famous paper in the American Economic Review 10 years after the German paper on permanent technological unemployment, where he made this metaphor of a permanent race 
the, between displacement of labor through technological progress and reabsorption of labor through accumulation. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is a, a modern version of the old debate between displacement and compensation effects, which is a very actual debate. For example, you may have noticed uh, first the discussion paper of Frey and Osborne in Oxford of 2013, then published only four years later as an essay, and later Frey wrote a book on it, where there's the argument that the digital revolution will cause uh, higher unemployment. Now, um, there's a the problem that you are, have much better information on what jobs will be destroyed by the new technologies, although not knowing exactly at what time in the next years, than the new jobs which will be generated by the new technologies. This we do not know fully uh, today. So there's a certain bias uh, in, in the debate. Now, uh, I will skip and uh, start here again. When you uh, are uh, analyzing dynamic processes, uh, when a new technology is introduced, so you have uh, a different perspective than what Neri Salvadori was referring to with the different islands or planets where the only dynamics is the view of the spectator, but it's comparative statics where the different islands were always in long run equilibrium, although different equilibrium positions. You have basically two options. And you can uh, look at the history of economic thought. The one line is the Austrian one, which started with uh, Bimbavec, but before there were already Stuart, Smith, and List stages approaches of, of the theory of economic development. But Bimbavec's concept of the average period of production, for example, was used in the famous triangles by Hayek in his LSE lectures, Prices and Production. And Hicks in his neo Austrian theory, Capital and Time, which was just published at the time when he got the Nobel Prize for his earlier work of JR, <laughs> which did not please Sir John very much, uh, the Laudatio, the committee in Sweden made. And on the other hand, you have the line starting with Kene and then later Marx, Leontjev, Sraffa, von Neumann, up to Pasinetti, particularly in 1973, with highly developed. Uh, uh, in the Sraffian line, the notion of vertical integration and economic analysis, where the emphasis is on a sectoral or horizontal approach. Roberto Scazzieri had published many articles and books on that. Now, the first one who tried to combine the two approaches, both of them have their advantages and disadvantages. In the stages of vertical approach, there's a much better and stronger emphasis on the time aspect of the traverse of the adjustment process. What was important in reality after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the transformation of economies in Eastern Europe and elsewhere. The sectoral approach, like it was developed, for example, in Leontiev's input-output analysis, whereas a certain neighborship, I would say, to Sraffa's approach, uh, is much, much better if you look at the interdependencies in the production process between the different sectors of the economy. And Fritz Burkhardt was the first one who tried to combine the schemes of the circular flow only for stationary economy at that time of Marx and Böhm-Barwerk, so to combine the best elements of the two, which is an extremely complex and difficult thing. Hicks moved from the two sectoral or multi sectoral approach in capital and growth in 65 to the neo Austrian one in 73 and later tried to combine it. And Pasinetti himself, and this is important, in particular with the structural economic uh, uh, dynamics from 1981 and the following up work, tries also to combine the two works. And I want to conclude with some remarks on uh, Pasinetti, who agrees to the statement Hicks made in 77. Uh, that he emphasized the important fact that normally process innovations always involve the introduction of new capital goods. And the introduction of new capital goods causes a major problem uh, for mathematical models emphasizing this. And therefore he says the only relation that can be established runs in terms of cost and of capacity to produce final output. And this is precisely what is preserved in an Austrian theory. Now, this was basically agreed uh, by Pasinetti, 
who in his 81 book, uh, which I think is more important from a technical point of view than the 93 one. The 93 one is more important for the distinction between natural and institutional <laughs> elements, which will be discussed later in the afternoon, I guess. Uh, so Pasinetti emphasized that because of the changing coefficients over time, the vertically integrated analysis has a greater empirical significance for structural economic dynamics measuring capital goods in units of vertically integrated productive capacity of the final commodity has an unambiguous meaning through time, no matter which type of technical change and how much of it will occur. And let me conclude with some uh, remarks because he develops a model basically because he wants to analyze the structural dynamics of employment in this process. But even in his most complex model of 1981, where capital goods are produced with the help of capital goods, they are specific for the different vertically integrated sectors. So uh, otherwise, you cannot, at the first stage, uh, give for the different vertically integrated sectors different rates of productivity growth, rho i, and there are also different rates of growth of demand. And only when they are identical, like uh, uh, rho i equals ri, then uh, employment would remain constant within the sector. Otherwise, if the rate of productivity growth would be higher, you would uh, have a reduction in the sector. And if the rate of demand would be higher than the rate of productivity growth, you would have increased in the sector. And the argument is quite important that uh, to keep full employment for the uh, whole economy, you have to constantly reallocate labor between the different sectors of the economy. But there is one problem if you give rates of productivity growth uh, externally uh, and you have the basic products in the system, you can't do it. <laughs> so there was a critique starting with Bertram Scheffel's review of Pasinetti's book later by uh, Marc Lavoie and others, and Pasinetti reacted with his uh, vertically hyper-integrated sectors. <laughs> but I think there are still, uh, still some issues to be debated for a fully satisfying answer in this sense. And he mentioned that even when he uh, de uh, empirically uh, constructs the vertically integrated sector, it would be more or less on the basis of a leon Schaffer approach, where you get the original empirical data. Okay, thank you for your attention. I think it's okay. First of all, okay. Hello. Okay. Thanks of all. First of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers for this uh, great workshop and for the invitation. What I will present is a common work uh, with uh, George Oakley's, and I also want to thank uh, Vlas Misos for uh, helpful comments, suggestions, and etc. So, we will start with a very interesting subject that was uh, to think about the G matrix of Pazinetti. However, uh, through the investigation 
and uh, thinking of uh, some other work that we have uh, implemented in the past, we change and uh, mostly, and because of uh, the time pressure that we have right now, we will focus in specific uh, bounds, specific bounds that has to do with uh, activity levels. So, I will not uh, that much refer to the Pazinetti G matrix, but it's a real interesting case to speak about that. We start with the relationship uh, between the wages, the wage rate, and the rate of profit that, of course, this relationship described by the price system. On the other hand, from uh, the fiscal quantity system, we have the relationship between consumption per head and the growth rates. This takes into account a lot of scholars, among them Pazinetti, has said that the prices and at the same time the structure of outputs can change in a very strange and complicated ways as the profit rate, or in the case of a structure of output, the growth rate changes. Taking also into account positive view about uh, the structure of the economy and the consumption, let's say we focus on this next. And uh, we talk about the book with the name uh, economic system and uh, growth uh, economies, uh, developed economies. Uh, we have to say that Pazinetti gives the proposition that the structure of production is bounded by the consumption uh, bundle, the consumer, the, especially by the consumption of consum consumer demand. And uh, going further, this is somehow also opinion of Pazinetti is that the, these bounds are more strict in the case of uh, less developed economies. So we based on this, our purpose is to rethink this view of Pazinetti and uh, somehow to try to investigate that first theoretically and next empirically through to any kinds of view zone. For this purpose, we will give some uh, lower and upper bounds for the levels of activities, especially for transform activity levels. And we will focus more on activity levels and uh, the transform activity levels of, uh, of uh, consumption uh, bundle when the growth rate is corresponds to zero. So let's talk about our basic assumptions. That is that we are in a linear system with uh, simple uh, production. Uh, we have uh, basic commodities in terms of uh, SRAFA. Of course, the capital, this is the data we have. It's uh, circulating. Uh, furthermore, we have the common assumptions about the input output coefficients. Also, we have to say that uh, the growth rate is uh, uniform in this case, and of course, our system is viable. So, we can uh, write the quantity side of our system. This is a well known equation, first one, where x denotes the vector of activity levels, c denotes the index of consumption. We have to focus here that. F denotes the activity vector required to support one unit of consumption when growth is zero. Furthermore, here we have the G matrix that, as we know, the J column of uh, which represents the vector of activity levels whose operation will produce as net product just the capital stock required to support the operation of the J process at unit level. From this matrix, we can have also the maximum rate of growth, Z max, and we continue our transformation 
creating a Z matrix that somehow combined by Z matrix and the Z max, the maximum and Z value of Z matrix that is similar to a stochastic matrix. Um, let's say it's a row stochastic matrix, matrix. And for this transformation, we somehow have a new transform system that is similar with the previous one. And the similarity also has to do with the diagonal matrix that the main elements in the main diagonal are the elements of the Perron for Bernoulli's uh, Asian uh, values of matrix A. So at the end, the matrix B is a row stochastic matrix. What does this mean? All this, that somehow we have a view, we have, this is the last mathematics that I will present. We have an image that we can have an upper and the lower bounds for the relationship between these transform vectors. So in this case, the upper bound, because our matrix is stochastic, for any economy in this transformation is one. And the lower bound depends on a If we introduce a technology from the point that changes uh, when the red starts uh, improving the, the condition of technology, if we introduce a, a technology which is given to uh, is uh, leaning to, towards labor share, then we may we may, nobody uh, uh, can prove it, uh, can uh, actually identify it, but we may see labor share to gain relative to investor, investor share. Let's go back to some numbers, which are extremely important to remember. Uh, these are coming from uh, a presentation given to the American Economic Association. Uh, it's a seminar conference in two, uh, 2014 by Odette Galore. She says that uh, if we count uh, the regional distribution of income between, or the average distribution between uh, year one and year 2010, uh, in terms of uh, constant dollars in 1990, we see that between the four uh, five different continents in the world. Uh, the difference between the highest and the lowest, Africa and uh, Western offshores, were exactly 1.4. One, one times four, almost the same. After uh, 2,000 years, the difference is completely, uh, dif uh, completely uh, different. We are talking about 15 times more in terms of the constant uh, uh, in constant values. This proves to a certain extent what Bob Lucas uh, presented on his macroeconomics for 21st century when he said that roughly uh, in 1800s there was no difference between people, that the poorest countries today are exactly the same level as they were in 1800. We have modern economic growth with major societies in the world uh, getting all this uh, benefit. And at the end, we see no uh, uh, theories explaining how we can s overcome this specific problem. I don't want to present. I would like to stop in three different uh, quotations. One, one of them is by slouching towards utopia, a recent book by Bradford De Long, uh, when he says that uh, even though when we started, when we observed and begin, uh, started the industrial revolution, we all thought that we're getting into an economic utopia, right now the new generation has new problems. It's not only the inequality, we have uh, global warming, 
We have economic depression. We have many, many other things that we never thought that we were going to uh, uh, get after all those years. Second is uh, Ben Bernanke. When at his uh, Nobel lecture, he said that credit markets stress can serve both as a source and as amplification of economic fluctuation. Which means what? That in our current condition, we can spend some time observing credit markets more seriously than we like to see today. And of course, uh, Ben Holstrom and John Tirol on a very interesting book, Inside and Outside Liquidity, when for first time discuss, try to organize a neoclassical approach uh, on financial theory. And of course, global financial stability. The principal unanswered questions right now, these I'm going to discuss today, are the following. Is there a unified theory of growth? Let's say a theory of capitalist development. How the existing evolution results from classical distribution of externalities on the allocation of production resources due to existing property rights. How the observed economic environment is a result of certain uh, initial conditions. If we observe different societies, is there a, a wedge between stationary states of some societies and uh, a catch-up theory? Is there a possibility for those societies to get into the bad wagon of a catch-up theory? And sometimes, let's say, China may reach a point when the average distribution of wealth is similar to the one, uh, or not similar to the one, better than the one with the United States. And finally, uh, why an economic system against all theoretical odds under perfect capital markets and flexible capital and technological mobility produces major economic crisis. If everything is perfect, why we have crisis? Because we have. Let's go now to, to the model. We learn from the theory that, in general, we have feasible and unfeasible production transformations. The feasible ones, let's call them KI, LI, and QI, and the unfeasible KJ, LJ, and QJ. The general understanding of, that comes from the classical uh, production function is that uh, at least when we have feasible uh, production processes, we may get a total distribution of well of uh, of of uh, the output. Marginal productivity distributes the income according to the wealth according to the distribution according to the uh, in, to the benefit given by members of the society. Two interventions, one by Bassinetti and the, state, the idea of stationary state macrodynamics. The second, Robinson, product differentiation and monopolistic competition. All right, let me recap. All right, all right, all right. Let me present the model, all right? The assumptions of the model are the following. First, there is a technical definition of exploitation. In each economy, exploitation exists if some agents get more than the social necessary uh, to earn the consumption battles when. And second, less time than the socially necessary to earn uh, and others get less, uh, less uh, resources. The, the, the bundle is smaller. Second, total value of exploitation 
resulting from the production process is accumulated on exploitable assets owned and traded by the firms. Third, we assume that part of assets, firm assets, cannot be promised or pledged to investors. Outside investors must share the firm's returns with insiders, large shareholders, managers, employees, employers, either because they later enjoy perks or they, they enjoy some other shares uh, they deserve from, from, the, from the contracts. We also assume that consumers cannot pledge any of other future income. This is something that I impose in order to avoid introducing um, an insurance market. And finally, uh, the key implication of non-pledgeable uh, pledgeability of the firms cannot be counted on using as collateral only part of, of their net wealth. What we mean is that even though the, the company may believe that its net worth is larger than they can try to pledge, the, the financial market does not get it. Define assets as a distribution between exploitable and non-exploitable assets. Define wealth as a distribution between pledgeable and unpledgeable wealth. Define production function as a function, uh, I defined it in the previous stage, of wealth and, excuse me, assets, all the assets, plus S, uh, which is the uh, market power of a specific firm that this stems from the, uh, um, uh, John Robinson's presentation. The issue, uh, what is important from that is that the companies with larger uh, monopoly power uh, get better, they have higher wealth. So for the wealth of the company, monopoly power is important element. Second, finally, Profits are uh, related with the, the value of wealth uh, times the pr production function minus the cost in terms of assets. Let me introduce the idea of financial friction. Free firms live to in two periods. Make an investment decision when young and produce when old have asset access to the same production function, all of them. Invest in assets and monopoly power according to the following assumptions. Output can be used to make new exploitable assets on investment and makes one unit of a new exploitable asset to make one unit of a new, ex uh, of a new exploitable asset. Exploitation assets are producing productive for two periods and then are fully depreciated. So this is a big difference between the original uh, Passinetti idea that everything uh, is, uh, uh, all the investment goods are deployed in the first uh, period. Uh, assets are exploitable, uh, are new and old assets, and we deal with two first, uh, two Cases. Case one, first best, there is no market power, there is property right of new assets, all new worth is pledgeable, and investment decisions are financed by return earnings. So there is no financial market to support this specific uh, investment uh, period. I introduce, I'm trying to avoid using uh, prices. So I, I'm introducing a Ramsey planner uh, in terms of quantities, something that I explained in the previous uh, discussion. So the decision is between the valuation of production and profits and is equal to the consumption times the exploitable, uh, the new assets that are part of the exploitable assets to, to do. Let us now introduce financial market and frictions. Okay, then I can send you. Concrete remarks. 
What I was trying to say is that, let me organize it. First, we said we should introduce passionate idea about sectors. In order to keep in our model the originality of Passinetti's point that there are production levels that can be uh, reachable and production levels that are not reachable. This is an idea taken by Passinetti, by Passinetti from uh, Samuelson, Solo, and uh, Dorfman on the activity theory of the production when they introduce a, a, a non-continuous isoquant, but rather uh, specific uh, uh, linear parts of, a, of an isoquant. Second, I'm trying to introduce the idea of monopolistic competition by uh, John Robinson, not in terms of strategic behavior. That's, that's very important to understand it, to accept it. John Robinson gave us a hint that, look, don't go to the regular oligopoly models in terms of dynamic and strategic behavior. Skip it. The idea of monopolistic competition is a lot more flexible for macroeconomic modeling in terms of uh, the idea of oligopolistic uh, behavior that we use regularly in microeconomic theory and introduce the strategic environment. Third, I decided that it's important to incorporate uh, a model with quantity and not on a price, quantity adjustment and not on a price level adjustment. It's very important because if we skip this inefficiency in this problem, we can bypass the whole discussion about marginal productivity, pricing of the labor, labor and all that, and all these ideas. It's, it's extremely more valuable. Finally, I have to introduce something that was not existed during the years, the years of uh, Passinetti and Robinson, something that didn't, uh, were not in, in existence during the years of Keynes. The credit market is totally different from what is right now. That's the very important. So the decisions taken by uh, firms to negotiate and support pledgeable income and non-pledgeable income in a market, it's extremely valuable for our discussion. And of course, uh, this is due to the new developments that we observe in a market which is considered as efficient but still is still is under major inefficiencies. Thank you very much for the time. Okay. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, we had a certain asymmetry during the day. There were many more papers on Pasinetti. Then there were contributions on Jeff Harcourt, but this will be at least partially corrected by our last speaker, Costas uh, Repapis. And uh, let me mention to you that uh, Costas uh, was the last but one PhD student of Jeff Harcourt in Cambridge. The last one was Robert Court, who is doing all this business on Cambridge economics, Oxford economics, LSE economics, Chicago economics, and the next one in the pipeline, according to my knowledge, is Harvard economics. But Robert Court was a PhD student of Jeff Harcourt in the history department, so Costas is really the last PhD student of Jeff Harcourt in the economics department. <laughs> and let me use this possibility to thank very much Costas and Nicolas Theokarakis for taking the initiative to organize this conference and to organize it so well. Nicolas will chair the final roundtable, but now it's the word of Costas and Jeff Harcourt. Thank you very much. As if it's not enough to be, um, to be speaking in the raised podium, I have a, a quite a quite a send-off from uh, Professor Hagemann. So let's see if the presentation can cut muster. Um, 
let me let me start by saying that I'm I'm very happy I'm presenting after Professor Haritakis because um, in some ways I wanted to speak on something slightly different um, to the topics earlier today, and I wanted to speak about uh, probably the, the 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 differences, slight differences between Jeff. Jeff Harcourt and, um, and Luigi Pazinetti, because Jeff Harcourt was also interested in, uh, in other things. He spoke about very much about the, um, uh, the Cambridge controversies and the issues, but he was, I think, much more amenable and interested in uh, the neoclassical theory in some ways and shape and form. Definitely much more of a discussion. And one, what I wanted to say is that some of his legacy has to do with a question that I think is pertinent and interesting today, and to which a demonstration we saw earlier today by, uh, uh, well, just before by Professor Haritakis. Now, uh, Peter Kenyon, who worked on a paper with him in uh, 1975 on the investment decision, wrote quite later in the 80s that one of the things about the microeconomic foundations of the post Keynesian macroeconomic theories is that they seem to rely to a large extent on the markup pricing formula. And the mainstream thinks this is a very, you know, a very uh, badly done thing, that it has no real foundations. And the real question is, you know, we, we heard um, uh, Ivano and others speak on Pazinetti and um, say that the, 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 the idea is that the macroeconomics takes over for microeconomics. What can we learn within this framework about microeconomics? And I'm trying, and I hope to convince you today, that there are some interesting ideas about revisualizing the firm and therefore the decisions um, on this level. Now, um, you probably know that, especially since Kaletsky work, there is the flex price and the fixed price model, and this is something that John Hicks also spoke about. There are kinds of markets in which, um, in which prices are just depend on the level of, um, of, of, of demand, and there are times where there is um, output changes when, when, uh, um, faster than price changes. Um, now, I think one of the interesting things is that, of course, we identify most of economic theory with uh, flex price um, ideas, which is what orthodox theory is about, whereas fixed price ideas focus on the idea of a normal production costs and the markup sort of being fixed on these normal production costs. Now, in standard economic theory, to put it in this way, um, Price is seen as a key variable. And of course, then, um, if we go into the Walrasian system, there is the optimal allocation of resources that follows from price. Um, one of the big arguments against this view, which has been very well explained earlier today, so I won't dwell on this for very long, is that competition, of course, in classical economics is a process, not an end state. And of course, um, this is based on social classes, and with this you have the idea of capital and the process of capital accumulation. Now, all of this is fair and good, but you will say, I'm a business, what am I going to do with all of this? And I hope to convince you that there is something to do about all of this, and in fact, to convince you rather that business, uh, businesses have been doing this much before um, the neoclassical economists theorized that what they do is maximize profit in a particular way. So one of the key strategic variables in classical economics, this is what Peter Kenyon and Jeff agreed, uh, agreed with said, is the, the level of capital expenditures. And these are derived, of course, for investment plans of firms. And um, the focus of firms very rarely is a short-term profit maximization as an end in itself. And this is one of the major differences. No one disagrees that firms are in the business to make money in the long run, but the fact that they would be doing that in a maximizing framework at every point in time is a very big difference between seeing this as a long historical process and seeing this as a neoclassical um, uh, equilibrium in which the price as they say, thermostatically just increases and decreases to clear the market. 
So um, one of the things that I think I wanted to speak about today is that post-Keynesian writers argue that the behavioral go for, uh, goal of firms is to maximize other things. Occasionally, growth in sales subject to a minimum profit constraint. That is different to maximizing profits subject to other things. So the very framework, mind framework, when you come from a Marxist or a classical framework is quite different. And this is what Harcourt tried to uh, emphasize. So in his 1975 paper, I'm aware of the time, so I'll go quite fast. Um, he says that, you know, the firms in reality maximize profits, but in the long term. The maximization of profits is set not in abstract time, but in historical time. And it is uh, an outcome of trying to deal with future uncertainty and present uncertainty. Um, therefore, the short-term short -term goals could be entirely different. And in fact, uh, when, they, when, um, when they did empirical analysis, they found, even as far back as 1939, if I have time, I'll note this, um, uh, that, that companies very rarely just see um, that they want to maximize profits in a period by period time. So what does Harcourt and Kenyan try to do? And this is something that Kaletsky noted in 1937, Calder and Mirlis in the famous paper in 1962. Um, they maximize sales and retain market position. They secure financial needs for investments and covering costs. The, the kind of funding, how funding comes for the firms is a very important part, which Harcourt actually introduces as, um, in, in the 1970s. It's very important if this funding comes from, like, Arita, uh, like Professor Haritaki says, if this funding comes from the, the capital market or it comes from its own funds uh, and reinvested. And of course, one of the things is that they plan for spare capacity. They never want to be left without spare capacity because that would wound them in a market war. So um, this determines markup in the following way. Firms make a decision about future investment plans um, because they don't want to be uh, caught without extra capacity and depend on, on, on firms' projections of market demand. They don't depend on the, the market demand today. They try to make counterfactuals in a broad sense about the future, to think about what market demand would be and therefore what kind of, um, what kind of uh, spare capacity they need to create. Now, they choose a markup as a second step after the, they, they, um, they find what they need to reinvest and what they need to put in place for next period. The markup is not there necessarily to clear the market today. It is there as a sort of an anchor which will clear the market in the medium run. So um, prices, prices are more an indication of the of the expectations of the firm and the, fo and the expectations of the firm in the, uh, in the medium future than rather the, um, the conditions of the moment. Now, I wanted to say something about choice of techniques, which is to a large degree what is discussed today. Um, the two things um, that I have another five, seven minutes, so good. Uh, the two things which I wanted to say, the first thing is that Harker and Kenyon suggest that although we speak about choice of techniques at the firm level, which are neoclassical, the whole capital controversy did not as, as such attach the firm decision. But he was actually very much, to a large degree, also against the idea that the capital labor uh, decision is a marginal one at the firm level. He actually postulated, following John Robinson and Eatwell, that usually, in most firms, there is a best uh, practice technique. Um, this best practice technique is sometimes given by the competition, it is given by the conditions and the structure of the firm, or it is, in fact, given by the level of technology. But if you start from that, you realize that the whole nature of how firm decisions are taken sort of turns on its head, and I'll speak to what, what that means. So, um, uh, Eatwell and, and Robinson write in 1973, industry in real life, a great number of alternative blueprints for different increases do not coexist in time. These blueprints have to be developed 
to have flesh and bones. This goes back to the discussion that uh, Christina and um, that and Scott's had to, together. It's one thing to speak about different things that could have happened. It's another to experience them. It's an entirely different situation. So once you take a decision, and this is, um, this is an important thing, once you take a decision, that sets future decisions in motion. Um, once, therefore, you have a product, you have in the, you, the production function becomes a point rather than a differentiable curve. And from that point, you decide your next steps as history sort of progresses. So expectations play an important role. Um, um, knowledge and experience do not just appear independently of the firm's actions, but each process has its own past and therefore its own future. And doing counterfactuals in the past is as, sim as difficult as doing it in the future. So technology factors to a large degree, in this module at least, and in some of um, the work of, um, of um, Harcourt and Kenyon, speak of, determine the choice of technique because, of course, these decisions become important in the future. One of the things that I wanted to speak about is that if you start from this perspective, the causality of how the firm works reverses itself. Because if you think that conditions on the ground dictate the most obvious choice on the production technique, that frames the expectation for the future. That expectation for the future then determines markup and determines the spare capacity that you have to lay down. This, if you think about it, is the opposite way than thinking it in the, in the mainstream way in which the differentiability of the function gives you, um, gives you all the choices available and your expectation of the future determines the choice of the technical, uh, at the technical level. And here you see the very interesting combination between um, the choice architecture, which has some uh, commonalities with a classical theory, with a Marxist or a, a classical perspective of how the uh, technical conditions and the invest and the uh, and the and the and the um, uh, uh, banking conditions and also the the institutional conditions frame these decisions. Now, one of the last things I wanted to say before before I close um, is the following. Um, Two things. I think for hardcore, expectations are dramatically different to what they are in the mainstream. For one other thing, they are expectations about future possibilities. They are not expectations about ideal states. In many of the models, I think, of the neoclassical uh, idea, the expectations then home in into some kind of ideal state. Um, if you're thinking about expectations in a historical time, that means you are doing uh, an analysis of the different kinds of frameworks. And I particularly like this paper because it has a very specific connection to the University of Athens. Um, uh, Harcourt and, um, and Kenyon mentioned Krimpas and have this quote by Krimpas there who's, who was a professor here for many years and a very important economist in the, in the department. So um, Harcourt and Kenyon speak, uh, quote Krimpas in 74 and say, uh, and Kribas notes, decisions are long period decisions. If they bind us in the long period commitments, an investment obviously does, and therefore require us to have expectations about the long period. This is a long period in historical time. Um, so one of the things, one of the last things I wanted to say before I have to close is that what happens if you have many rates of return? What happens if you have, sorry, different, um, things to choose from, and um, different capital and labor ratios to choose from. Well, what Harper shows is something else as well, that we assume in economics, in a classical economics, that choice happens because you maximize net present value or internal rate of return. However, the two things, one in a paper that I wrote with Mauro Boyanovsky uh, very, very recently on accounting rules, the other I want to say now is that the data that firms collect do not match up with what we expect 
they need to make decisions. Why is this important? Because accounting data and economics data are very different. Accounting data and the accounting rate of return has um, has has has, uh, has 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 no has no direct relation with the internal rate of return. That means that firms make decisions based on entirely different data sets than what economists think they're making decisions on. However, the, there is a much deeper problem with 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 real data, and in fact, uh, with what data you can collect at the at the firm level than people have realized, other than, I think, Harcourt, who has worked on, uh, who worked on this for a very long time. And that is that I, outside ideal conditions when the, the, there is no uncertainty, the different kinds of measurements of rates of return, the net present value, internal rate of return, accounting rate of return, from which most firms do, and payoff or payback period, give you entirely different decisions. So what kind of framework you have would determine what kind of process you decide. Therefore, institutional frameworks determine this. And the last thing I wanted to say is that outside of golden age, this is what Harcourt said, outside of golden age, it's very difficult to say what kind of profitability firms have, other than to use the accounting rules that they own themselves um, the, themselves they create. And therefore, the accounting rules create the reality of, um, of uh, the profits to which then, because of conventions and because of the institutional framework, they then have to adhere to. This is a significant issue because it is quite different to have um, heuristics that approximate an ideal state than with to have heuristics that simply work because they are based on conventions. And these are heuristics that are based on conventions which are determined at the institutional level and which then create further yeah, investment decisions for the firms. Now, I have more slides, but um, we will keep them for another day. Thank you very much for your time. We have a bit of time for some questions or answers. I only ask those who want to make a comment or have a question to come here to speak into the micro. If, yeah, if you come. You can also use this. Uh, oh. Okay, you can. So uh, thank you all for your excellent presentations. Uh, I have a question uh, mainly for Mr. Cardinale. So uh, during your presentation, you mentioned the institutional problem. Now, during the last two decades, we've witnessed a tremendous growth in organizations of the so-called third sector. Now, third sector organizations are mainly producers of services, but still they do not seek profit. Now, under the framework of this um, problem, would you treat them as institutions or uh, maybe another form? Uh, that's, thank you very much. Void of theory of no theoretical significance of 
Ecology, one of the main Especially came out the Oxford virtual crisis. Again, very, very heavy. When Jo Robinson upon herself hey, to play the she is a with this ruffians have not been very So this is a very business. I wonder whether I can. I really enjoy the way you said it out. They'll always puzzle me. committee was like it was mm? oh Are you hearing me now okay the, uh, the organizing committee was uh, three people I like his rubber piece and myself, uh, so uh, give uh, you as we say. Uh, I Relevant in the sense that uh, the representation can be formed in several ways. So I was wondering whether you think those representations uh, in a way, or you have a way that this type of representation is formed. For example, if I'm a merchant. any role at all. Possibly in Freudian analysis where concern for wasted energy complexes. Now, uh, it is interesting to note that Pasinetti died 
all expecting, we are expecting, and still are expecting, is to put on the labor theory of value. Whereas uh, Arquit, on the other end, was working, had serious work on the idea of markup theory. I don't want to comment, well, I'm certainly with the labor theory of value story, but, uh, but my comment has to do more with the understanding of the evolution of this group of people or school of thought uh, through times and coming to the present era. I, 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 don't, I don't want to make any further comment. It's just for uh, you guys to comment at the round table afterwards. The, my second point uh, has to do with something in English which I didn't clearly understand. There is a claim that in year one, Anno Domini, everybody in Africa, uh, Europe, and uh, the known world of the time had something like the same thing. And throughout the history, uh, some people came better off and some others worse off. If I have that correctly, maybe I, I basically, because I changed the capitalism. The interesting data to know is the initial uh, what Marx called primitive accumulation of capital where the initial endowment that people had when capitalism. There I think that we are going to come across huge differences between uh, primitive accumulation. And in the end of the day, although Solo was of the opinion that primitive accumulation will play no part and everybody will be developed at some point. Uh, on, the other, on, the, on the other end, now the, it appears to be that we are not going to be developed uh, to, to the same point, but this is going to be our point. This is the new discussion on uh, theory. Um, both Marcotte uh, and Thomas, uh, not revolutionaries, uh, much of the opinion that the world in which we live is uh, not the best of all possible worlds. What can be done in order to make it better? I think that is a very, very important. And of course, our. How can we have a metric of success failure in terms of private goods and not caring that much about public goods? Both Jeff and Nancy said we're concerned with public goods and I just wonder what Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, without him and all the and all the groundwork that he has been preparing, uh, preparing the workshop, we wouldn't be in this I will I will start with Christina. Very much about this. The question of markup is one of the rather sad stories I think in post Keynesian theory because I think, um, I think it was disliked at the time because it was seen as um, one, it, it was disliked at the time in the 30s because it was seen 
much outside marginal analysis, and especially Khan never came to terms probably with that kind of perspective on the general theory. Um, but it's a very big topic of what Khan, and, and you are much better versed than me, what Khan would take electively and wouldn't take um, in the reading of the general theory. I think, however, Jeff's take on this shows the eclecticism involved. He spoke about Kaletsky. Um, he spoke about the fact that, you know, it was, it was for him a very important tool. And um, this gives me something I wanted to say, which is quite important. Markup came up as a second life in theory, as a kind of a thing that may explain um, short-term departures from um, short-term departures from um, from equilibrium, from the classical equilibrium. This is an entirely different concept to the Harkorian and to the Kaletsky vision of a markup, which has cumulative processes, has the idea of um, of of uh, of uncertainty as part of connecting the price with the cost. Now, I quote what I didn't use when I was up there. It said the markup is important because um, supply and demand do not determine for Marco the immediate The immediate plan conditions of the in most of the markets are determined by pricing decisions. These over time would integrate dynamic nature of our future. But that is not done because you know, they said it's not yesterday, it's not So, the story of the markup is an interesting one. I haven't, I, um, I don't know if the story of the market is because I'm still thinking about it. But I agree with you that the different parts within nature take a very different view of it. Um, and I think it is something that I'll return to it now, um, Nikos, you have an excellent uh, comment about Keynes. I think Jeff, I think Jeff tried, like Keynes, to play um, the different conditions in a unified framework. Um, he used to move over the different conditions. He was not afraid to see about choice theory and choice architecture. He was not afraid to see about the some markets may be in a very classical fashion, and therefore are you know, um, He was following very much uh, the general theory of the view that if you know where to place the limits of these things, you are able to use these things. So I, I, I see very much in the configuration of the What do you think that generation brought much more forward is of the class of classical system that the classical system the 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 now, I'll take in one thing, um, uh, Nikos, the second Nikos, and a nice, nice terms, uh, uh, focus, uh, point on how to make things uh, and the world a better place and the use of public and private goods. Jeff Harper always spoke about uh, the need of other classes to make a sign. And he said his greatest need to have a place is that they share that bond, which is actually something that. Rather, try to see what can actually, what can actually, we can save the world, and therefore build models that are related to this. I think in this, it was very clear and very precise. That's why it was very effective. And one of the reasons I want to speak about market prices today, and cost prices, and for cost prices, and all the cost prices, is because I think um, that a lot of the inflation rate in the last two years comes from what we call the markets pushing out, seeing the supply chain increasing in uh, 
ISIS. Very much. Right? Out. I understand. That's good. Cool. specific issues. One is the map Nikos criticized, uh, the table about the major institutional issues in terms of wealth. There is a trend towards this distributional uh, inefficiency. Second, I thought that this specific result uh, relative to the Marxist uh, approach relate, is related to the private ownership of the capital stock. So we may say that the private ownership of the capital stock holds back the development of specific areas, and that's what Costas and all the others, as Ariadis, I mean, and all the others talk about uh, the, uh, the, the growth theory, the permanent growth theory. Now, let's go back to, let me add something to what I said about markup theory. I think uh, the you, the theorist, I say to you that the use of markup theory resembles some knowledge that is not so relevant right now in the theory. It goes back to I think Right now, we may say that market power, and that's the important introduction of uh, Robinson, what I was trying to say that I was, uh, I tried to skip it due to the time uh, framework. Uh, I think the important uh, element John Robinson uh, introducing in our thinking is that macroeconomic theory can rely upon just production and market power. This is enough. Exit. The interesting part of, uh, uh, of um, monopolistic competition is that is not, a, let's say, Bertrand oligopoly. It's a Cournot type oligopoly. It's an equilibrium uh, model with quantity adjustments. That's the important part. So you may say that it's but it's irrelevant for my class uh, neoclassical economists. I don't care about that. I absolutely agree with you that the market works like that. Populist, structural efficiency. Now, the new discussion of growth Much questions, one answer. One is the failure of public goods and the new discussion of growth. What is missing for the typical Cambridge group? What is missing? Is the idea of complementarity. We learn from our textbooks that everything is on a substitutability issue we learn that production theory stands 
on the decreasing return of state, uh, uh, part and not on the increasing rate uh, part. But complementarity is part of an increasing uh, equilibrium. Increasing rate. Right now we have strategic complementarity because I gain, you gain, and we are all very happy, like the famous uh, match between Intel and Microsoft. Intel and Microsoft learn to, to, to produce what one wanted to produce by the other. That was, that's the idea, and the idea of, of complementarity is something that is missing in our theory. And I think Jean Tirol, when he talks about common good theory, this is what he's trying to say, that forget about our societies, that we are societies with competition, with fear, animal spirit, with substitutability, with killing your enemy and all that stuff. That's the idea that we should incorporate. And let me tell you something. We talk about the globalization right now. And that's an important issue right now. What's happening between China and the United States and all that stuff. Why? Why we try to fight the free market, which is extremely important for the was extremely important for the development of China and India, and we try to close our borders in terms of subsidiarity. I don't want to offer you this kind of information from a technological point of view. This is the issue that we should consider as an important fact in our future. This is how I Finally, hey, uh, thanks for the question. I think the best way to address them in an organic uh, fashion is to start from the last that I received from uh, Heinz Wurz. Um, so I agree on the idea that they were reformers and not revolutionaries. I think uh, uh, were, were concerns Pasinetti the way he thought about the success of a society in terms of public goods was in the way that he specified his, uh, his normative frame. It was based on the full employment objective, but even further than this, it was actually um, for what concerns the natural system, not just the, the full employment one, so a further requirement, was even the idea, which in many ways is quite, uh, is quite ambitious, that profits should become only a technical requirement for growth, that wage should appropriate all the surplus, that the labor theory of value should hold so that labor is uh, uh, rewarded in a proportionate way. So he was also pointing out quite explicitly that a capitalist system does not allow that. So either government should settle for a second best or find ways to approximate that through other policies. So in many ways, was very much at the forefront of his analysis that this should be done. What I think he doesn't do is to point to specific ways. So he was very interested in developing the normative framework. He did very little, I think, on, well, he had some ideas on that, on, on how to pursue it, but they were, I feel, not fully integrated with his own analysis. And this is what I'm trying to explore. So what is the political layer, the institutional layer that we have to look? So when it talks about what so social groups uh, constitute themselves, what kind of institutions they push, it's a kind of idea of looking about, okay, we know what the structural requirements are, but how do different societies go about it? This brings me to the question of Nikos about uh, class consciousness. Um, I think what I'm trying to do is, I'm agnostic as to one of the great uh, you know, Marxist topics, about the fact that there, is, there exists an objective uh, a class struggle and then you know, it could be a matter of recognizing it or not recognizing it. I, I remain agnostic on that, but I think if we stay at the level of observation of societies, we see that the kind of uh, forms of uh, group consciousness that emerge can be quite, uh, quite varied. For example, historically, sometimes we see that uh, Groups come together by country instead of by class, for example. We've seen it in some major conflicts. Sometimes they come together by industry instead of by class. Sometimes they come together by class. So we observe a lot of variety on this. 
how do we theorize it? As something exogenous, as something endogenous? Now, I would say that we should think about it endogenously in terms of how historically, in certain situations, some um, part of our cultural reasons, part of our reasons more related to technology and economic structure, some uh, groups tend to emerge rather than others. I do think that there are degrees of freedom in the sense that the economy in itself leaves some openness, but obviously there are the cultural and the political aspects. But when I say endogenous, I don't mean it in the, in the technical modeling sense, try to show in the model how they emerge endogenously, although it could be done in a sense, but more in a way of interpreting specific situation. Almost an historicist, but in, in a reduced way, approach where we study specific countries, we see what groups are relevant there, what cultural features lead to some sort of visualization instead of another. So something that happens at the cultural as much as at the, at the structural level. And I think one of the reasons Passinetti's approach is attractive is that it, open, it leaves a lot of space open for doing that. I don't think he did a lot of it. I think he leaves the space open to do that. By the way, I think it's not only Passinetti that allows that. I think a lot of structural model could be reinterpreted in this sort of normative way that then allows from a historical and cultural analysis up to us to do it. Which leads me final to the, to the questions I received first which is about whether first, uh, third sector organizations are institutions or there's something else. I think Passinetti is very open when it comes to what is an institution. For him, everything that is not the structural and the natural path is an institutional element. And the issue is whether they help reach the, the collective uh, objectives that characterize the institutional framework or whether they don't. And in the case of the third, sector organization, I think the question is what kind of social societal interest do they represent? Do they bring forward some idea for the whole of society? Do they represent some specific groups in society? What kind of worldviews they, they bring on? I think this is how they would be integrated within the kind of framework I've been suggesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there a short? Okay, uh, this is uh, the last uh, session of the workshop, and this is actually a round table where we have uh, 
for distinguished guests, Al Hagen, French courts. Uh, in fact, I would like to ask them two questions to start the discussion. Round table. Your own questions regarding. Questions. First, we know that we won the Cambridge, uh, Cambridge debate on the matter of capital. So what went wrong and we couldn't capitalize on our victory, electoral victory? The second question is how do you think we should proceed? Economy, main, whereas uh, thinks that they have all the answers. Let's loot the minds questions, and I would like to ask uh, the rest of you to ask questions to our panel. Yes. The question is like, we learn about the classical data. We know that the traditional issue is We realize that even early supported by a credit market. We thought at the point of time that we have resolved those major terms of real relationship, real and financial. We thought, dreaming. Can we say anything right now towards the new research we should implement or support in order to overcome crisis and Well, all this is not round, but is a rectangle. So, <laughs> makes things a little bit uh, more difficult to. Person, very interesting, but difficult to answer. Let me summarize. Answer to our. Power relations. How they lose.
across the path. Because you may be one that came to If liberal democrats like were not writing on these issues, probably most of the stuff never would have entered into the top journalism. Now it's almost impossible to have such information. But in early days, there was a controversy of solo terrorism. They made these topics acceptable for needing economic journalists to find and also. There's also a certain irony in the story that somehow it may come from the contribution by the Jews to the people. That some of the main participants of the Kentucky case of the Kentucky case of the Kentucky case were people like Adam Schiff, or also Sam Kachacho. And now the linear wage profit.
Oh. But see, you know, medically, it's a different sorrow. But it's just irony that many of those who are criticized and sent to the school of education that's not how much more or less they are waiting for the prevention. Nasty. No, uh, no, but I mean, uh, yes, no, the question is this, science typically is able to correct itself. Uh, this is what, what happens. Discussions. Yes, no, <laughs> no, we, I, I think that the we consider the axis on the sun, Can be can be uh, the earth can be considered flat, no problem. So and this is actually what generally uh, you know, relative relative uh, relativity uh, yeah, yeah. Now, what I uh, if we observe science, uh, economics. I think that uh, until uh, capital control, it was in some sense how to Our papers try to complete these There are other streams, which is typical of something. What happened now? Best storyteller of our days to find the American economy and, uh, and something like that. Who cares about a model like that? There will be other people who have reason that the problem. So actually, what we have now uh, is a situation. Even uh, you know, models like endogenous uh, growth, 
Evrel. Other things, but I am much of the that economics was not able to answer at pushed in some sense the to consider not the enlargement. Other side, This different nothing. But I Present. Questions are indeed challenging. We are inclined to think that the functioning market Dark valleys where those are uh, trying to understand the world which they do. One example. Earth behavior. It doesn't use these equations. But what he says is exactly this. Because of this, the system of regulations is blown up.
حق از اور سبجیکٹ حق Push button meaning you have an answer economics and then you push a button, the model rumbles a little bit and it is going on and down. This is not the perspective. This is you see focusing attention on the selfish individual and constructing the economic system on the basis of that. Of Scottish, Scottish and Lyme very well, and purposeful action, not only others. Not having such a wonderful record, hardly any past
ability and we should become much Facing the question whether My name is Lita Van Doru and I'm going to sorry now. I want to make one question special to Professor Marcus and the other. Um, my question is since we my question is uh, since we use the the markup uh, very in, uh, in a lot of models in post Keynesian theory, uh, why we don't use the monopsony power? So I know you have write some uh, specific uh, papers, I think some years before, regarding uh, John Robinson, and you have uh, done a critique about the monopsony power. 
but I think uh, it's a useful um, tool that we can use to uh, to make some predictions about the labor market and uh, we can use also uh, with uh, markup and uh, monopoly power in or mono monopoly power in order to to show more uh, about the, the labor market this is my John Robinson, monopoly, the theory of monopoly, a monopsony power. Sorry, I, well, I don't know of the answer. Honest, exactly answer this question. You're referring to the Robinson book, 1930 book, particular, or something that she wrote later on. The 1933 book. Well, you see, this is a funny book. Uh, it, was, uh, it was the book that gave her academic uh, no, uh, knowledge, but she rejected the book. Well, the book. And the fact, basically, Book, very standard time. So it is very odd. Why she wanted to in approach to economic get away from the In fact, she used a book which was very Marshallian, very much the same line as the just changing the slope of the curve. Avenue. Book. Rafa didn't like it at all. And she herself realized that that was not the way to go, particularly because what was lacking in that was strategic interaction. Very static. You know, know that in perfect competition, you know what? To act on the basis of your thinking, what your competitor will be doing. You want to have something relevant. I did not answer to your question. I understood it. Get something. Right? Because we're talking about the future, uh, could you give us uh, some uh, opinions about uh, how the work of Harcourt or Pazinetti some limitations for all of these people that's here, that they take account? about the future, about the tradition, but also to see the future. I'm certain. Post-Keynesian Some of them, by for example, Ricardo, Ricardo in one in a letter to Alok, contemplated the case 
final point, the process of mechanization that started in the of the revolution was a fully automated implies that were capitalists. Sorry. Now I think Others One example, the economy of peace and war was not of the opinion that wars are so to speak a thing of the past. Development. Conquering other countries in the world. After all, I'm so important that we no longer want to live in countries or in any.
One utility function for the beginning of mankind. But <laughs> point from a theoretical point of view. No, I think. I'd like to wrap it up. I'd like to thank you very much, the, all the participants. <laughs> Professors Marcuzzo, Hageman, Salvatore, and all those who were of uh, mostly I'm graduate students that this workshop possibly way you see our science first thing great seven Was also another graduate. I did the stacks we had during the palace from Artia. Then Logothetti was very. Yes, I would like to imagine that almost 100 years ago, an Italian friend of Piero's Rafa wrote a letter from the prison cell uh, talking about the optism, optimism of the will and the pessimism of the mind. And when things go really bad, what we can do is use every, uh, every spark we have, every source we have in ourselves order not to make it happen. So I think this is so from the letter by Dr. Ramsey in this workshop and 